Hello, and welcome to the Kathleen Spracklin Podcast. I am a woman on a mission to assemble a cadre of writers, thinkers, and teachers who are transforming the world one character at a time. And it all starts with one thing, a deep understanding of human motivation, why people do what they do, and the forces that drive them. This is episode 33, The Payoff for Classifying Emotions. I'm continuing to read a very fascinating book by Lisa Feldman Barrett. The book is called How Emotions Are Made. And it's a very interesting study of how emotions happen biologically. I'm more interested in in character development from a fiction writer's standpoint, but I also deal very deeply in emotions. So this book was quite fascinating to me. As I mentioned in an earlier podcast, she relates how the attempts to classify emotions have failed. It's early in the book, and she's going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the different ways in which they have failed. I compared it, for example, to the ease with which you can classify emotion uh, struggles, which are expressed in the form of emotions. But she's focusing entirely on the emotions themselves. So I took a look at the studies, two of the studies, actually three of the studies that she mentions in the introduction in chapter one. One of the studies attempts to understand information that's of a clinical value, having to do with college students as subjects, and the students were asked to identify whether they were feeling anxiety or depression. And there was a hypothesis related to that as well as to what circumstances were more likely to cause anxiety versus depression. Two other studies were mentioned with completely different motivations and payoffs. The obvious value of a clinical study is that maybe you can relieve anxiety and relieve depression. The other two came from very different motivations. One had to do with NBA players and attempting to determine exterior from exterior emotion analysis what is going to produce team chemistry. And the value of that, obviously, is a better performing team, which has a strong financial motivation and value. And another study was attempting to identify dangerous passengers through facial expressions for TSA. And that clearly had a security value. So now we're looking at the payoff of studies and emotions because I'm wondering to myself, why are they focused on this squirrely topic of emotions when the primitive struggles are so much more directly testable and much more directly examinable? And when you look at it, There are many different interests and motivations that are being served. So let's compare what value the understanding struggles might be in any of these different uh, payoffs for the studies. The challenge with the study that where the value was clinical, where the students were asked to identify situations under which they felt anxiety versus situations under which they felt depression. And the difficulty that came about with that study is that students differed dramatically in their facility with which they were able to fine-tune the different emotions. Very often, they lump them together. Anxiety and depression were both used when what the student meant to say was, as Lisa Barrett, Feldman Barrett put it, I feel crappy. So they could not get the fine grain information with sufficient consistency to be able to utilize the self-reporting of anxiety or depression in any setting that would have a chance of having clinical value. If you look at that usage, and you want to find out what's going on from a primitive struggle standpoint, I would wager that the students would have no difficulty distinguishing between 
two different kinds of struggle. One type of struggle might be, for example, two very, very similar. One might be a sense of overwhelm in the student is working at capacity, doing the best that they can, completing all assignments as best they possibly can, but the total volume is just so great that they feel snowed under by the just the sheer weight of the volume of the work. That is a struggle that could be very, very clearly identified, especially by a student. And if you compare something very similar, you could have another student who is having difficulty knuckling down to the work required in a, to succeed in a university setting. The student might have a much lighter class load, a much lighter overall pressure of assignments, but because they can't get themselves to focus and, and manage their own behavior to sit down and do the study, they could be facing something that is that exteriorly might seem quite similar, both feeling, ah, I'm not sure I'm making it. Both might be feeling anxiety and depression. But if you ask them to delineate the struggles that they were facing, it would be very, very easy for them to separate the struggles. And if from a clinical value and setting, it becomes much easier to deal with a problem when you're tackling it from the point of view of a struggle. The student who is experiencing overwhelm could be counseled, is it really necessary that you take all of these subjects at once? Could you spread them out? Could you possibly do a summer class to lighten your load? Or maybe this is just a temporary time and if you just get over this hump, things will even out on their own. Whereas the student who's struggling with being able to get down to, to the business is going to need a very different type of counseling. However, when you're looking at a struggle like that, it's certainly not going to be of any value really in spotting a terrorist. Those are dramatically different motivations. But if you're looking at where the big money is going, the big money is going on the team performance, on the spotting terrorists. It's going on attempting to discover something about somebody without their participation necessarily that will be of predictive value. That is a totally different question than the question of clinical value. So I think what, what needs to be done really there is sort out the motivations and a lot of times you get the feeling where, in fact, Lisa Feldman Barrett says that, well, when you abandon the classical model that emotions came to us evolutionarily and have are consistent from one person to the next, well, then you're going to need a whole different paradigm of treatment for clinical disorders. And I'm not so sure that that is necessarily true because if you're taking it from the standpoint of the struggle which gives rise to the emotion then the classical struggles do a very 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 good job of do pinpointing exactly what you also need in the way of treatment and in any case if you're a fiction writer emotion raw emotion is difficult to describe on a page and it's just as difficult to convey to your reader as it is to convey to the TSA agent to be able to spot it on the basis of a few clues. However, the struggles that are common to us all are very easily recognized and can be very, very quickly conveyed to you, to the reader, in the form of just a few sentences. That's all for today. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.